Hello and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And today's podcast is brought to you by Indiana University Press. Their Life of the Past series is lavishly illustrated and meticulously documented to showcase the latest findings and most compelling interpretations in the ever-changing field of paleontology. Find their books at iupress.indiana.edu. In our 222nd episode, we have a whole bunch of dinosaur news. We're going to cover three of the new dinosaurs. Last week, we covered two of them. We've got three more this week. There'll be at least two more next week. It's a good time. It's it's good and overwhelming. <laughs> <laughs> and we also have some other news, as well as Dinosaur of the Day, Maylong. And as always, before we get into the full show, we would like to thank some of our patrons. And this week, we'd like to thank Scotty, Megan Dixon, Kessler, Tristan Jewels, Grandpa Dino, Rhinosaurus, Morgan Eklove, Dr. Eigenbot, Lori, Risa, Kelly, Manda, Laurasaurus, Timmy, James Pasco, and Gabe. And Gabe just joined. And with Gabe and a few other patrons, we just reached our 110 patron mark. Woo! Which means I need to get busy working on a noise absorption panel. Yep. And buying a curtain, figuring out what curtain to get. <laughs> <laughs> so that when we make some more videos, they are nice and echo free, hopefully. And thank you all very much for getting us to that point. We've been getting a lot more patrons recently, and it's made both of us feel great. We talk about it all the time. A warm and fuzzy feeling. Yep. <laughs> Plus, a lot more discussion is happening on the Discord server, which is great to see, too. Yeah. So again, thank you. Thank you for being part of our community. And if you want to join, then check out our page at patreon.com slash I know dino. So jumping into the news, our first new dinosaur was published in Zootaxa or Zootaxa by Javier Paraga and Albert Prieto Marquez, who we've talked about quite a few times. It is an Iguanodontian and it's named Parisactus Evrostos and Parisactus comes from the Greek for intruder, and Evrostos is from robust. Robust intruder. Yes. The intruder part is because it's only known from a single bone, but it was amongst a whole bunch of other bones. Mm. So it's like this one dinosaur's bone is sneaking in with the other ones. Yeah. What are you doing there? <laughs> it's not a great way to intrude, get part of your body into something, but whatever. And then robust is because its scapula, which is the one bone that was found, is very thick and has a huge deltoid attachment compared to what you see on some of its close iguanodontian relatives. So the entire dinosaur is defined by that single nearly complete scapula. It's not even a full scapula. It's just like most of a scapula. It's not really shaped like our scapula though. I always kind of assume that everybody knows what a dinosaur scapula looks like because I look at them all the time. But you know, our scapula, our shoulder blade, is kind of like an equilateral triangle sort of thing. And shoulder blade is a good name for it because it's pretty blade shaped. But on dinosaurs, it's not really this triangular blade shape. It's more like our femur or something, really. It's like a longer bone. And then on one end, it kind of fans out. So it's, it's more of a long bone than it is a flat bone, I would say. In most cases, it obviously varies from dinosaur to dinosaur. The overall shape of an iguanodontian scapula is it has a blade part, which kind of fans out sort of like an oar, I guess, like the end of an oar. And then there's that thinner part, just like you have on an oar. But then if right after that thin part, that's sort of the, the handle of the oar, it edged out into a big like mushroom cap <laughs> sort of thing to attach to the coracoid, that's what you get on a scapula. So it's sort of fanned on one side and then it gets thin and sort of cylindrical in the middle and then it poofs out right on the end. So that's kind of a weird, maybe hourglass shape kind of. It's a, kind of a strange shape. I don't know how to describe it. It's a dinosaur scapula. But <laughs> in this case, it doesn't get nearly as thin in the middle between that blade and then like the bulging side as it does in most iguanodontians. So that middle part is a total of about two inches or five centimeters in diameter, which is like twice as big as an adult man's femur. It's pretty wide. Yep. 
And then on top of that, the bone is about a foot or 31 centimeters long and about four inches or 10 centimeters wide on that end of the blade. So you can tell there isn't that much of a difference between the narrow point and the wide point. It's robust, one might say. <laughs> so this was found in the Pyrenees Mountains in northeast Spain, less than 50 miles from France, and is from the Maastrichtian, so about 70 million years ago but not quite the last group from the Maastrichtian. So it's not like the Hell Creek in the US, which seems to be like right before the impact. It's a close relative of Rhabdodon, which was around at the same time and place. So the obvious question is, was it really just a Rhabdodon? A robust one. Yeah. So fortunately, we have found the scapula of Rhabdodon and it looks different. So we, we can be pretty confident in saying that it's not just a Rhabdodon. But there are some other close relatives that are also iguanodontians that we haven't found a scapula for yet. So it's possible that this is a scapula of one of those guys that's already named. And if that's the case, then this one will be invalidated and the name will disappear. Overall, the scapula isn't that long for an iguanodontian. And I was looking into that because I was trying to figure out exactly how big this individual would be. And the researchers didn't speculate on the age or size of the individual. So I don't know. I think it's an adult because they didn't say it was a juvenile. <laughs> but I don't think they cut into it or anything either. So I'm not sure if they know. And yeah, maybe medium sized, I guess. Could be a sub adult. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. I don't know if scapula is a good bone to look at for the age of a dinosaur. I know a lot of times they look at vertebra to see if those are fused or they'll look at like a long bone, like a femur or a humerus or something and cut it and look at the structure of the bone. But yeah, that's the first dinosaur. I'm going through them in increasing skeletal completeness mm. so that it gets more exciting every time. <laughs> the next one is known by, for more than one bone. Is it known from two bones? It's known from at like at least 10. Oh, okay. Yeah. Wow. It's really a big jump a in jump number up, yeah. of bones. <laughs> it was published in JVP by Julia Marsola and others. And this one not only is known for more bones, it's from the complete opposite end of the dinosaur family tree and also size of dinosaurs. So the last one was pretty big. You know, you're talking about a pretty large hadrosaur. This one, you're talking about a really small saurischian and from the Triassic <laughs> rather than the Cretaceous. So pretty much the exact opposite dinosaur, if you could describe them that way. So it's pretty hard to classify these Triassic saurischians. And that's even what they call it. They just say it's a Triassic saurischian. They don't even call it a theropod. They say that it has, quote, theropod affinities, end quote. <laughs> you really don't want to put their chip down on anything. But they also say that their analysis quote, suggests a possible closer relationship with theropods than with sauropodomorph dinosaurs, end quote. So as we all know, saurischians are basically just theropods and sauropodomorphs. So they think it was probably more like a theropod, but it could be before the split, I guess, and just like a super early saurischian. I don't know. One analysis put it on its own little branch of the family tree, but kind of near Dilophosaurus and Coelophysis which would be very theropod-like. And the other put it next to Eoraptor in the same little subgroup and generally near Herrerasaurus. Herrerasaurus is a weird one too, where they don't really know where that one fits. It's kind of just lumped in the early Triassic dinosaurs. So this early <laughs> Saurischian is from the Santa Maria Formation in South Brazil. And we've covered that before. It's a really great spot for Triassic dinosaurs. So we've talked about other dinosaurs from there. And it's named Nandumirum waldsangii. And Nandumirum is from the indigenous Tupi Guarani words and sort of related to Portuguese. So Nandu means running bird or rhea, and then Miram is small. So last week we had a dinosaur that was like, what was it, emu, I think, mm. in the local language. And now we've got rhea in the local language. Well, dinosaurs are birds. Yeah, and it's like a popular move, you know, like we've got the ostrich mimic, now we've got a rhea, a small rhea. <laughs> no, I don't think it's smaller than a rhea. I guess, it, yeah, it might be smaller than a rhea. It's very small. And then the species name is after the Waldsanga site where it was found. So that's how you get Nandumiram Waldsangae or Waldsangae. 
depending on how you want to say it, Latinize a word that was never intended to be Latinized. <laughs> so by the name, you can tell that it was probably quick and small. And based on the bones, like if the last one was robust, these bones are really long and skinny. They describe it as really gracile. So it's like, again, very much the opposite. It's a quick early sauropodomorph or theropod from the Triassic. <laughs> A good example of what makes dinosaurs so cool. Yeah, how much, how different they can be. Mm -hmm. And as I promised, they found more of the dinosaur. They basically found the full right hind limb starting all the way down at the claws up through the hip. So it's like the entire, if you took a cross section of the dinosaur and just sliced out the leg from where it touches the ground all the way to the top of its back, basically, they got one piece like that. And that's about it. They got a couple vertebrae from the back and the tail. And really, that's all they found. They estimate that it was about three feet or less than a meter long and only about one foot or 30 centimeters tall based on their drawing of it. So yeah, it's pretty small. That might be smaller than a rhea. I haven't seen many rheas, <laughs> so I'm not sure. They also took histology samples and they found two lags, which means it's at least three years old. Those are like those lines and tree ring growth, basically. Mm-hmm meaning it probably wasn't fully grown. They said it could be a juvenile Saturnalia, but the authors think that there are differences in the bone shape and muscle attachments that wouldn't have changed as it became an adult, and therefore it should be its own species. But other than that, there's not too much to say about it. It's another puzzle piece in the early evolution of Sauriscians. It would have been nice if they had gotten a more complete dinosaur. Hard to do, though. Yeah, but it's really hard to kind of nail down this early family tree without more complete dinosaurs because it's really hard to compare them. And they said that in their phylogenetic analysis, which is like, you know, we're missing all the things you need to compare it to its close relatives. Like you don't have a skull, you're missing arms, you're missing a lot of the hips and things like that. So you just kind of do what you can. And then depending on their assumptions and their family trees, they obviously ended up in pretty different places. So hopefully we'll find more later. And last but not least in the new dinosaurs is the most complete dinosaur find uh -huh. that we're going to cover this week. <laughs> it's published in Cretaceous Research and written by Lucio Ibiracu and others. And it really isn't that much more complete than the previous one, but it does cover a lot more of the body. So it's more exciting, I think. It's another Iguanodontian, so we're going back to Iguanodontians, also from the late Cretaceous not surprising because iguanodontians weren't a lot around for that long in terms of dinosaur timing. It was found on an island in a lake. And by that, I don't mean that it was an ancient lake, but a present day lake. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So it's called Lago Colhue Huapi, and it's in central Patagonia, also known as southern Argentina. And apparently these islands were exposed in 1993 when the water level dropped so the water level in this lake varies quite a bit. And it went down there like, oh, look, there's an island. And they went out on it and they found a bunch of dinosaurs. <laughs> the opposite of flooding. Yeah, it's pretty cool. The authors call them, quote unquote, ephemeral islands, hmm. which I really enjoy. Makes sense. And they described the one that this dinosaur was on as, quote, about one meter of unevenness at approximately 100 meters of wide and 500 meters of long, end quote. So that adds up to about 12 acres of <laughs> land. And I, I like the one meter of unevenness. Yeah. It really sounds interesting. Like it's a very low island, but it might be good for finding dinosaurs. You get little spots that are eroded down farther. They've already described a few dinosaurs from the site. I think the first one was described in the early 2000s. And one of them at least was a titanosaur. So the fact that we're getting an iguanodontian from the same spot is cool because it's always nice to see kind of the exact diversity that was going on at a specific spot. And this one's name is Sectensaurus San Juan Boscoi. Hmm. It's a medium-sized ornithopod, according to their description. And Sectensaurus is based on another local language. Sectin is the Tehuelchi word for island. And San Juan Boscoi... <laughs> is after the National University of Panagonia, San Juan Bosco. That's how I know it's San Juan Bosco I, because if you just look at that, you would not know how to say it. True. <laughs> it's really helpful to know that it's named after a university. So in the last two weeks, I think we've got at least three or four dinosaurs that were named using the local language. It's pretty interesting. 
they found part of the skull, several vertebrae, and fragments of the arms and legs in this presentation. None of the bones are duplicates, and they appear to be about the same size, so the authors assign them all to the same holotype, and therefore they think that they're all from the same individual. Otherwise, you have to pick just one bone, but if you think it's all the same individual, you can include as many bones as you want. Something that you don't see all that often, they also included some bones from previous finds that have been published in the past. So they included part of the hips that was found and published about earlier, as well as a find that had some more vertebrae, a rib piece, and some foot bones. So they lumped together two previous finds along with some bones that they're publishing for the first time and called it all the same holotype. Even though it isn't articulated, it was kind of a smattering of bones, but they found them all very close together. So they're saying, we're pretty sure it's the same one. Hopefully they're right. Based on the one cranial bone that they found, which is the frontal, they think that it might be a juvenile because apparently this bone changes shape as it ages, or at least it does in similar ornithopods. So it looks juvenile shaped (laughs) according to their research. But on the other hand, the vertebrae show what they call firm attachment, suggesting that it was nearly an adult. And I think firm attachment basically means that it was almost fused. So we talk about how vertebrae fuse as the dinosaurs get older. So I guess it was on the way to being fused. It's just firm attachment at this point. Getting there. Yeah. So I guess it was like an older juvenile or a very young adult then based on this analysis. And then as far as where it fits in the family tree, in both of the analyses that they did, it came out as an iguanodontian, making it, quote, the first non-hadrosaurid ornithopod named by the latest Cretaceous of central Patagonia, end quote. And it also came out as the closest relative to Tenontosaurus in both of their analyses, which was around much earlier, at least 30 million years earlier, and in North America. So... There aren't any really close South American relatives that have been found yet. Maybe they'll find more bones in that lake. Yeah, more islands pop up. Yeah. (laughs) In another part of the world, there was a, well, I say new dinosaur trackway found in Winton in Queensland, Australia, but it was actually found last year. There's a team that's been working on relocating the trackway since September of last year. So far, they've relocated 25%, which is a really good thing because they saved the footprints from a flood. They had terrible floods this year. So the opposite of what was going on in Garrett's story. (laughs) (laughs) And the tracks are 95 million years old. They're from three different types of dinosaurs. They've got sauropods, ornithopods, and theropods. There's 55 meters of tracks. And according to paleontologist Dr. Stephen Poropat, the ornithopod and theropod footprints are really similar to tracks at the Dinosaur Stampede National Monument, which is about 100 kilometers away. And the sauropod footprints are from titanosauriforms, They have 40 meters of continuous sauropod footprints. There's about two dozen forelimb and hindlimb footprint sets, and they're really good. Some of them include a giant thumb claw, and some of them have impressions of individual toes. Mm. Yeah, and these footprints are about a meter long, so pretty big. And Porofat said that, quote, these footprints are the best of their kind in Australia, and their shape can be distinguished from all known sauropod footprints worldwide, end quote. So, pretty good day for... Sauropod tracks. And ichnologists. Yeah. (laughs) The team, so they're still working on relocating the rest of the tracks throughout the winter. The trackway weighs 500 tons. Oof. Yeah. They've submitted a paper for peer review, so I'm sure there'll be more about it out later. And there's going to be an exhibit at the Australian Age of Dinosaurs Museum called March of the Titanosaurs that's going to open up in May 2020. Nice. Yeah. In Hampshire, UK, Bright Bricks, which is a professional Lego building company, and I didn't know that was a thing until this story, (laughs) is is working on the Brickasaur show for Marwell Zoo. And they're building Lego dinosaurs in all sizes. In the video, they show some that you can hold in your hand and then others that are life size. And they've been working on the project for about a year. They spent the last six months building. So what they do is they 3D render models, then they get a layer by layer view which colors to use on the outside. And then the team just decides whatever bricks work best on the inside. And as they build, they glue the bricks down. Makes sense. Don't want anything to break. It's taken them about a thousand hours to design and create the T-Rex. And they also have a Stegosaurus, which is known as Steven the Stegosaurus. Hmm. And that one's taking three to four weeks with a team of four people. 
I guess that makes sense. The bricks are not, the Lego bricks are not that large. So the exhibit opens April 5th for anyone in the UK in Hampshire. So it's a thousand hours for both the designing and the physical placing of each individual Lego? For the T-Rex. It varies depending on the dinosaur. For some reason, I always figured that they had some sort of automated process to do like a really large, you know, at least combine because sometimes they're like those big pillars and things like that. Yeah. Maybe some companies do. I don't know how many professional Lego building companies <laughs> there are. <sighs> yeah, that's true. I have seen videos of robots putting together Lego bricks, but I don't know how precise it was. Mm -hmm. It might have been more of a test of like, look how cool our robot is yeah. rather than like, we're going to actually use this to put together giant Lego sculptures. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so in Dubai, another part of the world, somebody put on a T-Rex inflatable costume and then went flyboarding and did flips in the air. It's pretty impressive. What is flyboarding? It's an extreme water sport. I can't remember the other names of it, but it's where you working with a jet ski, you put some stuff on your feet and then you propel yourself out of the water. Okay. Interesting. Is it one of those that's kind of like a jet pack? Yeah, like a jet pack, but for your feet. Interesting. And then there's a board involved for some reason? No, no board. Why is it called flyboarding? I think flyboarding is the name of one of the brands that has gotten oh. really popular. So now people just call it flyboarding. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. But anyway, this guy did it in a T-Rex costume and then did flips. It's pretty, pretty good. Impressive, yeah. <laughs> In games news, Apex Legends, which is a battle game about legends and it's by EA, they have some dinosaur Easter eggs. So for anyone who might be playing that game, you can find small dinosaur toys known as Nessies on the map and then you can shoot them. <laughs> and there's a subreddit that tracked down all the dinosaurs in the arena. There's 10 of them. Apparently, if you shoot them in a specific order in one match, then a giant Nessie, which I mean, these all basically look like the Loch Ness monster, comes out of the ocean. Cool. That reminds me that I just finally found the paleontologist in Red Dead Redemption 2. Nice. <laughs> Took dozens of hours to find it. But you still have to find the fossils. Yeah, I haven't found any of the fossils yet. Maybe I'll do a live stream and go hunting for them. <laughs> <laughs> Keep an eye out. Might be one of the new videos. Might take a very long time. Hopefully <laughs> there are patient <laughs> viewers. <laughs> just like real paleontology. Yeah, that's true. In Phoenix, Arizona, they got their Jurassic fight night at the Gila River Arena on February 17th. And we talked about this before, but I didn't know any of the details. I just knew that there was going to be some Jurassic fight night involving people in those heavy dinosaur costumes, not the inflatable ones. <laughs> so there's a video and it shows two raptors in robes growling at each other. And there's people in those heavy raptor suits. And apparently they all trained for a year and then the event had live music, dance groups and more. I I'm guessing there will be other events, maybe not as big as the first one, but... Well, we heard about the first one actually happened, I think, a couple months ago, and I read some reviews on it, and people did not have a good time. Okay. <laughs> that might... Maybe that was a test for this one. This one sounded like it was bigger. This... I don't know. It looked pretty big. They had, like, a whole arena, and then, like, lots of people there. People were complaining about how bright the lights were and how long it took and that nothing really happened. Oh, uh, okay. So hopefully that one was better. Maybe they're learning and iterating. <laughs> hopefully. <laughs> it sounded bad. A lot of people talked about leaving before it was even done because they were so bored. That's too bad. Yeah. Well, hopefully that one wasn't boring. The latest one. Yeah. The last, thanks to Keegan who shared this one with us. So for people who are looking for dinosaur and other natural history fashion ideas, which... Always a good idea, in my opinion. <laughs> Ashley Hall, who we interviewed her and her husband, Lee, a while back, has started a new Instagram at Dress Like a Scientist. And the tagline is, want your closet and home to look like a museum? <laughs> so there's a lot of posts by people who found natural history clothing, jewelry, accessories. I saw a picture of some pretty cool dinosaur Tupperware. There's a lot of jewelry. There's some stuff with pockets. What does cool dinosaur Tupperware look like? It's just Tupperware with dinosaur images on it. Okay. Yeah. So it's still shaped like a regular Tupperware. It's not shaped like a dinosaur. No, I think that'd be too impractical. It would be. That's what I was wondering. <laughs> Before we get into our dinosaur of the day, we have another word from our sponsor, Indiana University Press. As Garrett mentioned, they have the Life of the Past series, which is really well illustrated and showcases the latest findings and interpretations in the field of paleontology. So I want to call out one of the books in the series, which is called Patrons of Paleontology. And we've mentioned this book before, but this one is about a lot of the 
famous people who were early paleontologists or early with dinosaur fossils anyway. So it seemed worth mentioning again. In the 19th and early 20th centuries, North American and European governments generously funded the discoveries of such famous paleontologists and geologists as Henry de la Beche, William Buckland, Richard Owen, Thomas Hawkins, Edward Drinker Cope, O.C. Marsh, and Charles W. Gilmore. In Patrons of Paleontology, Jane Davidson explores the motivation behind this rush to fund exploration, arguing that eagerness to discover strategic resources like coal deposits was further fueled by patrons who had a genuine passion for paleontology and the fascinating creatures that were being unearthed. These early decades of government support shaped the way the discipline grew, creating practices and enabling discoveries that continue to affect paleontology today. So, sounds like a very interesting read, just like all of the books, really, in the Life of the Past series. And they, like we mentioned, they have some that are specific to dinosaurs, but they're, it covers all kinds of paleontology. And so if you're interested in either Patrons of Paleontology or any of the other books in the series, then go to their website at iupress.indiana.edu and you can order your copies. And now on to our dinosaur of the day, Mei Long, which was a request from Gabe via Patreon. So thanks, Gabe. Also, thanks for being a patron. Meilong was a true daunted that lived in the early Cretaceous in what is now Liaoning, China, in the Yixing Formation, and the type species is Meilong. The name means to sleep soundly, and the full name is Soundly Sleeping Dragon. Pretty good one. And it was named in 2004 by Xing Shu and Mark Norrell. It was found in a roosting position, like birds, with its head tucked under one of the forelimbs and the legs folded under the body. Then a second specimen was found and described in 2012 by Chu and Gao and others, and it's in the same posture, and that just shows that that posture wasn't a fluke. They were probably buried quickly in volcanic ash after an eruption. They were both found in volcanic sediments, and they may have also died because of carbon monoxide poisoning or maybe asphyxiation. It's really hard to say, but they must have died quickly to preserve that posture from life. It looks like they're sleeping, but it's possible that they also went into that position to protect themselves from the volcanic eruption. It's intense. Yeah. Sort of like the Pompeii mummies. Yeah. Although if they're sleeping, maybe they were in that posture to stay warm. That's a nice thought. Staying warm as they froze to death? Well, just in general, they didn't know the volcanic ash was coming. Oh, I see. And they were sleeping, and when they sleep, they try to stay warm. Gotcha. Yeah. Anyway, this position helps to show the relationship of non-avian dinosaurs and birds, and it may show that they had a common ancestor that lived not long before Meilong. So Meilong is one of the oldest known fossils found in the sleeping posture. Most dinosaurs have been found in the death pose, the head bent back. Neither specimen really decayed or was scavenged, which may mean that they were in burrows. The first fossil of Meilong found is of a young juvenile, and that was about 21 inches or 53 centimeters long. And it had some incomplete fused bones, so that may have meant that it was close to being an adult. Those fused bones keep coming up in this episode. Yeah. The second specimen had juvenile-like features. It was about two years old, and the growth was slowing. They did histology on the specimen, so it was close to being mature. Meilong had a lot of teeth that were spaced closely together, and large nostrils, a small skull, and long hind limbs. So it was a fast runner. It also had a large U-shaped wishbone and a large sickle-shaped claw on each foot. It lived in an area with lakes, streams, rivers, and, of course, volcanoes. Meilong was a basal truodontid, and truodontids were very smart. They had good vision and serrated teeth. There's another truodontid, Synornithoides young eye, which was also found in that sleeping position. Shu and Norrell said that Meilong's shared features with modern birds as well as the fact that they share a common ancestor, plus its small size, helps support the idea that getting smaller was important for flight. And our fun fact of the day is that humans and other mammals have larger muscles on our eyes than birds slash dinosaurs do and did. Weird. (laughs) I wouldn't have guessed that. It's really because dinosaurs' eyes are sort of fixed in their head, and proportionally speaking, birds have much larger eyes than mammals do, at least in terms of their skull size. Mm. So they're basically, it's like the eye is filling up the whole socket and there isn't space for the muscles around it. But birds do have some muscles that work a little bit better than ours. They have some ciliary muscles on their lens that allow them to quickly change focus and it helps them keep things in focus when they're flying towards things, for example. So dinosaurs may have had these muscles as well. And I think we've talked before about how maybe T-Rex could have spotted something from like a mile away. 
Mm-hmm. <laughs> so being able to focus across a really wide range of distances would be really helpful. And then obviously they have a muscle too for their nictitating membrane, which <laughs> is that weird second eyelid that a lot of reptiles, or maybe I should say diapsids, have that we don't have that kind of makes them look alien <laughs> when the uh. little nictitating membrane shoots across because it goes sideways and it's like semi transparent. It's kind of creepy, but they can blink without closing their real eyelid. Hmm. So, yeah, they have less muscles to move their eye because their eyeballs are basically fixed, but then they have like little special features that they have additional muscles for. I like to think of the you know, T-Rex nictitating membrane. I think the Jurassic Park animatronic had a nictitating membrane, didn't it? The original puppet? Yeah, I think so. That's so awesome. Indeed. And that wraps up this episode of I Know Dino. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss out on any new episodes. We wouldn't mind a review if you enjoy this show. <laughs> <laughs> also, join our community at patreon.com slash I Know Dino. And of course, we're on all the social media, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. Plus, we got YouTube videos, so, you know. And Discord. That's the best place to talk, for sure. Right. That's only if you're a patron. Yes. Thanks again, and until next time. Good day.